Hey, Tyler, have you ever wanted to make your own podcast? Absolutely, I have. Well, if you want to make your podcast, you should go to Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Here's why. For one, it's free to use, no monthly fees. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so you don't need any of that special equipment. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If Jeff and I can make a podcast using Anchor, literally anybody can. So, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 10 of the Pokemon Snapshot. Tyler, we are 10 episodes in. Can you believe it? It is a fantastic milestone. I cannot believe we've lasted this long. I know. It's it's crazy. I I'm so grateful for our listeners and if you want to get in contact with us, make sure that you tweet us at Pokemon Snapshot. Or email us at the Pokemon Snapshot at gmail.com or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. In fact, we had someone contact us last week, Tyler. We did? I know, yeah. Kate Davis tweeted at us. Awesome. What'd she say? Uh she said at Pokemon Snapshot. Uh these and these are all things going off of last week's episode. It says Cubone is my favorite Pokemon. I remember reading somewhere that Cubone was originally originally supposed to be the only Pokemon of its kind in the world, but then that was changed. I haven't read that before, Kate, but that is a possibility since in Lavender Town you did see the ghost Marowak, so that does kind of make sense that maybe they thought there would be only one of them. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt and assume that she is right. Yeah, I'm not saying she's wrong, no. I just haven't heard that myself. Uh... She also said that crepes are best because of their filling. And now here's here's a problem. Kate, listen. You're a great loyal fan. I appreciate you. I appreciate you tweeting at the show and giving us support. You're one of the OGs, but you are fundamentally wrong on this. If you could take a pancake and put another pancake on top of it, you could still have fillings in the middle, and you have a far superior product than a crepe. Yeah, I guess that's true, but as I said, I like savory crepes, and it's very hard to make a good savory pancake. You don't see many of those. You're wrong, Jeff. You are absolutely wrong on this. You know I agree with you on a lot of things. That's why I've kept you around the last, what, 12 years? 10 years? 12 years. 2008? Yeah, 12 years. Yeah, something like that. I've kept you around for a while because, generally speaking, you're a straight shooter, but you're wrong on this. I'm sorry. All right, and then her last comment was, and I always pronounce Pidgeot like Peugeot. It sounds Pigeot. kind of French. Peugeot, it sounds French. It is it's French. She must like French things like Misty does. Yes, uh, like crepes, which obviously Tyler doesn't like. I do not, know. But yeah, so if you want us to read your tweet on the Pokemon Snapshot, just make sure to comment at us. And Tyler, are we ready to get into the episode? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so today's episode is called Bulbasaur in the Hidden Village. And in Japanese, it was called Fush... I'm going... These Japanese names. Fushigidane of the Hidden Village. So no changes there. Uh, In Japan, this episode aired on June 3rd, 1997. And in the United States, it aired on September 21st, 1998. Awesome-tastic. All right. So first of all, I just want to throw out that it was that this episode was a breath of fresh air. The last two episodes were kind of garbage filler. This one is actually legit. I I did enjoy this one. Tyler, I know you're not a fan of the filler episodes, so it is going to be interesting when we reach later seasons because there's so many of them. You know, I and I don't always hate filler episodes in shows. Don't get me wrong. It's just the last two were very weak and had some questionable moral messages uh but there's none to be found in this one that is true all right so let's jump right into the episode we begin with ash and his party walking through the forest the narrator explains that ash doesn't have a compass and must rely on his instincts and that that means trouble 
I could not agree more with that statement, Mr. Narrator. You are absolutely correct in that. There's no way that this ends well. I put the exact same notes. Yeah, I'm like, oh, great, we're screwed. But at least the narrator knows how incompetent Ash is. I kind of feel like the narrator is almost the third presenter on this podcast because a lot of times I agree with their thoughts in the beginning and end. Like, they kind of guide me along. It's kind of nice how that works out. I just thought of something, Tyler. What if the narrator is actually Ash's father and he's just been following them around? Oh my gosh, that would explain why he's been missing all this time, too. I really hope that that's the case. He just hides in the in the woods and behind trees and he's just following them, which makes him kind of a horrible father since Ash hasn't seen him in who knows how long. Horrible, yes. Responsible, definitely more than Ash's mother in that case, though. <laughs> So Ash is explaining that the party shouldn't worry because that direction will lead them back to the past. So they're heading in a direction. He's like, don't worry. This is going to bring us back to the path. It appears that the party is lost because Ash and Misty begins begin to argue. So Misty's like, you've got us lost. Yeah, and I kind of like the, what they said here. Ash says they are not lost when obviously they are because then Misty goes, Listen, genius, if you don't know where you are or where you're going, that means you're lost. Absolutely, textbook definition. Brock then jumps in and tells them to chill, and Missy asks Brock to remind her to yell at him some more if they ever get back to Vermilion City. And honestly, Missy, I don't know if you're going to get there. <laughs> well, hopes. I mean, I assume they are since there's over a thousand episodes of this thing, but you know. Don't ruin this for me, Jeff. I'm watching this as if I don't know that this is going to okay. go on for another 20 years. The party then decides to take a break. While doing this, Ash spots an Oddish and pulls out his Pokedex. It explains that it scatters pollen as it walks around. Wow, super interesting. Ash gets very excited, however, and goes to catch it. Misty tells him to hold on because she wants to catch it instead. Yeah, Misty here says she gets to catch it because it is near the water, and water Pokemon are her specialty. For one, I don't think that's how it works, Misty. Uh, Ash saw it first. You can't just call your shots because it's near water. And that's why you could call any Pokemon and go, Oh, it drinks water, so that means I get to take it. Yeah, you're on an Earth-like planet here, Misty. It's like, what, 70% water? I can't remember. It's a lot of water, probably. Alright, calm down. And, and and if you want to get technical about it, there's water molecules in the air and everything. Like, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Don't even get me started on this. Anyway, she sends out Starmie, and, it, and Starmie uses Water Gun. It hits, and Starmie then tackles Oddish. This weakens Oddish. Oddish is down for the count, and Misty throws a Pokeball. But just then, Bulbasaur knocks the Pokeball away, and we have a legendary entrance by the legendary starter Pokemon, Bulbasaur. Number one in the Pokedex. It's truly amazing. I'm very excited to see Bulbasaur show up. It's like seeing an old friend in a way. Ash pulls out his Pokedex again to see what's going on with Bulbasaur, and it explains that scientists can't agree whether or not Bulbasaur is a plant or animal. It also says that they are extremely difficult to catch in the wild. Bulbasaur then immediately tackles Starmie, and Starmie is knocked out. Ash decides to try and sends out Butterfree. It uses sleep powder, but Bulbasaur blows it back and it puts Butterfree to sleep. Butterfree is then tackled. If you, I'm, I don't know if you're noticing a going trend here, but Bulbasaur is doing a lot of tackling people. After knocking out Butterfree, Bulbasaur runs away. Ash is upset and yells that this isn't fair and that he wants it. Ash is so whiny sometimes, and this is one of those times, like, he must have been really spoiled as a kid, because he, anytime something doesn't go Ash's way, he literally throws a little tantrum like this. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, I'm putting it down as the only child syndrome. Uh, he, obvi he obviously got to do whatever he wanted. His mom didn't even care to wake him up for the most important day of his life, so... Yeah, I mean, Tyler, you were a former teacher, I'm a former teacher. We've all had those kids where... You know, you talk to it like, man, your kid was really off today. What happened? You go, oh, he was up till three in the morning playing video games like it's nothing. Like, yep. Ash is one of those kids. Funny enough, I was going to make a comment very similar to that. You and I have both seen this a million times. There is no way this mother is very involved in what's going on in Ash's life because of the way he turned out. Yeah. 
The party then begins to walk in the direction Bulbasaur ran. They are crossing a wooden bridge that is crossing over a, a, a ravine. You know, think Indiana Jones where they're crossing. I think it was the second one where they're crossing the giant bridge. And and you just know, anytime you see a bridge like this show up, like one of those rope wood bridges that are hanging over a ravine, you know it's not going to hold. So that makes me think we had one of those near my hometown. Like it went, like... It there's a sign for it, and it's like a you know historical monument, and it's called the wood the swinging bridge because that's what it does. And my dad would terrify me because like hey let because anytime someone comes to visit, oh let's go to the swinging bridge, and then you step onto the swinging bridge, and what does my dad do? Shake it back and forth. Oh my gosh! So that reminds me, and I know this is a tangent, so I'll make it quick. But here in Omaha, Nebraska, we have the Henry Dorley Zoo, which is often voted one of the greatest zoos in the world. And we actually have an indoor rainforest biome that has a rope wooden bridge. And that was like my childhood goal was to bring this thing down. I'd run ahead of my parents so they couldn't stop me. And I would like put both hands on one end of the rope and my feet up on the other. And I would shake as hard as I could trying to bring this bridge down. Natural selection could have got me. I have no idea what would have happened to me if that bridge would have actually broke and my plan succeeded, but I probably wouldn't be here recording this podcast with you. And here, folks, is why Tyler and I are such great friends, like brought us together. He's the one who's going to shake the bridge, and I'm the one who's going to hold on for dear life yelling at him for shaking it. Exactly. That's a great analogy, Jeff. So, predictably, Ash and the party are crossing the bridge, and predictably, the bridge begins to rock and then breaks ash and everyone are hanging on for dear life brock actually falls into the flowing river below misty is hanging on to ash and she tells him that he has to pull her up ash says he can't but musters up the strength needed and he actually succeeds pulling misty and himself up off of the bridge and onto the other side of the ravine. And I just want to take a moment to point out that I would have been screwed in this situation. There is no way I could do a single pull up, even with my own body weight. Like, I haven't tried to do a pull up probably since high school during those like presidential fitness tests. Couldn't do one then, probably can't do one now. And with Misty hanging on to me, I'd have to kick her off, Jeff. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the presidential fitness presidential fitness test and i remember the pull-ups and yeah i can't do a pull-up now never could do it i remember my gym teacher just sitting there with this clipboard and there'd just be a whole row of us who couldn't do it and we just like hang there and he'd write one half down like he'd give (laughs) us credit for a half a pull-up wow your pe teacher was way nicer than mine they did not give me credit for nothing and i just want to point out that this is definitely a symptom of my fear of exercise machines and activities yeah, and actually this part was a little bit different in Japanese. So in the English version, um, Misty is encouraging Ash to hang on, but in the Japanese original, Ash tells Misty she is too heavy, and then Misty yells at him for implying that she is fat and that she does not weigh that much. <laughs> oh my gosh, why did they not keep that in there? Uh, well, and it's funny because I knew this going into the episode, and if you when it pans out, you see kind of the anime yelling symbols coming out of her mouth. And it makes more sense why they use those symbols there instead of... Because those are kind of for when you're mad, not when you're encouraging someone. That That's very true. She's very lucky that it was not me in this situation. I'd be kicking her off. I'd be shaking my leg like, Be free, Misty! Fly like the wind! I'm sure you'll be okay. This is a children's anime. You won't die. You need to search for Brock. I know, right? Speaking of which, they, like I said, Ash is able to pull Misty up They get to the other side of the river, and Misty says that they have to go looking for Brock, even though they're out of breath and exhausted. So they take off running down uh, the ravine above the river. As they are running down this area, Misty actually falls into a pit, pit, and it appears to be a trap. Ash asks how she got down there, and she says, I fell, you idiot. Ask a stupid question, and you get a stupid answer. Absolutely. Like, how else do you get to the bottom of a hole? It's not... I can't even get into that. So Ash says the whole thing seems pretty strange and helps her out. No dirt, Ash. They continue on their way but are hit by another trap. This time they are caught in a net that caught them up in a tree. So it's like one of those like classic nets that they have on the ground. And then when you step over it, it like shoots up into the tree and it like hangs you from the tree. That's what we've got. So Ash and Misty and Pikachu are now trapped 
and this tree. They appear to be stuck, and just then a Bulbasaur shows up. He stares at them and begins to walk away. So he just kind of looks at them and is like, nah, I'm out of here. Ash tries to call it back, but it will not come. Yeah, and this part, again, was another section where it was different in Japanese. Because as Ash is trying to escape the net, he starts shaking it. And (laughs) I love this. Misty goes, tells him to stop shaking it because it's leading him to touch her in inappropriate places. Oh. Yeah, I you can see why this was cut out. It's just I'm making a grossed out face in the Zoom call right now with Jeff. Like, holy cow. Yeah, the Japanese just let so much by than what the United States would let by. Yikes. Yeah, I definitely think that the US version was better in this case. That's a bit creepy. Yeah. So, at this moment we flash to Team Rocket. And Team Rocket is on a cliff overlooking the forest. They mention that they are there looking for a hidden village, and they hope the rumors of its existence are true. And we flash away again. Again, this is one of those flashy episodes. They've got a lot of locations going on. We flash back to the trap where Ash and Misty are pondering what happened to Brock. Ash believes he's been captured by pirates because Ash is honestly not a very smart person. So he literally believes that Brock has been captured by pirates at this point. Uh, His exact words are, maybe the river carried him far away, all the way to the ocean. Then some pirates spotted him and brought him aboard their ship, and one of the pirates had a wooden leg. Uh, But in the Japanese version, all he says is is that he was picked up by an ugly old hag washing clothes in the river. And what was that ugly old hag gonna do to to Brock in the Japanese dub? It didn't say. I think we can all imagine, probably involves eating him. Probably. I mean, isn't that what most old hags do in the, out in the woods? I mean, I've never ran into an old hag in the woods, but I can imagine that'd be my number one fear if I did. Fortunately, Brock then shows up. So he shows up and he cuts them down. Literally, he cuts the trap and they hit the ground really hard. Like, he doesn't brace them or anything. He's just like, clip! Trap broke. Brock is again showing his lack of caring whether or not the people around him get hurt. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, it, he doesn't even give them a warning. He's like, okay, boom, you're down, fall to the ground. It's interesting because his character is always the motherly type, So, like, but then he has these moments where not a care in the world. Yeah, I know. Like, he's, he's a really hard guy to read. Like, he's all, like, motherly and caring, and he wants to do right by everything. And then just out of nowhere, he's like, I'm going to grotesquely injure my friends. You do you, Brock. <laughs> you do you. Brock explains that he was washed down the river in the rapids when a woman pulled him out. She was incredibly beautiful, he says, and Ash says that's better than pirates unless she was also a pirate. I guess that's a true statement. I mean, pirates were not good people. That That's a whole nother thing that I could go on a tangent about. I, I, they've been glamorized in books and movies and things like that. Pirates were not good people. True. Okay, I would not want to run into a pirate in real life. Like, if you drop me back in, like, the 1600s, 1700s, and, and, and I had the opportunity to avoid pirates, I would take it. They then walk to this woman's cabin. So Brock is like, hey, this beautiful woman pulled me out of the river. And then he's like, I'm going to take you to her cabin in the woods. And so they go there, and when they get there, she explains, the woman does, that her name is Melanie. Brock introduces them to her, and she seems honestly very nice. Like, she seems like, you know, a really sweet person. The party then see a bunch of Pokemon sitting around and eating and generally having a good time. It appears that Melanie takes care of abandoned and injured Pokemon. It's some sort of Pokemon health spa, according to Brock. She explains that they hang out until they feel better. So she takes them in. Brock also explains that she collects plants and knows which ones to use in order to make Pokemon feel better. Ash then, of course, makes a comment that they both like taking care of Pokemon, and Misty decides to jump in and comments that Brock may love her in a joking way. Brock, of course, gets embarrassed and begins to blush. Yeah, and I thought this was weird because Brock is so outward when he shows affection to someone. I mean, it's never bothered him before to just say, you know, like when he asked Officer Jenny out. I know, like, it seems completely out of character for him to be ashamed of it, because how many people has he asked out so far? Like, two, three? 
Yeah, it's been, a few. It, it's been at least Officer Jenny, then the girl, uh, Gazelle from last episode. And I'm sure if he was with them, he would have asked out Misty's sisters. Yeah, absolutely. So why he's getting all embarrassed about this particular situation, I am not sure. Yeah, no idea. But as soon as he gets embarrassed, it does go into our Who's That Pokemon segment. Excellent. Who's That Pokemon? All right, and then the Who's That Pokemon for this week is Bulbasaur, who in Japanese is known as Fushigidane. I love that name. Sorry to interrupt, but I love that name. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's pronounced Fushigidane. I'm I'm not really sure, but... We need, like, somebody that works for the podcast that speaks Japanese so they can help Jeff with this stuff. Yeah. Because for all we know, he's just butchering it. Yeah. And I'm going to imagine he is. Yeah, just let me know if I'm... I guess I could type it and, uh, you know, Google Translate and have them read it to me, but... That's doing too much, Jeff. Yeah, but uh, Bulbasaur's basic information, we have he's number one in the Pokedex, which we said earlier. Uh, He's a grass poison type. He is two foot four inches tall, weighs 15.2 pounds. He is known as the Seed Pokemon, and he evolves into Ivysaur at level 16. Uh, Bulbasaur's origin, his name. Bulbasaur may be a combination of bulb, a rounded underground storage organ present in some plants, notably those of the lily family, and soar, which is ancient Greek for lizard, commonly used for names of lizards and dinosaurs, which Bulbasaur is pretty much a lizard, so that's why the scientists don't know whether he's plant or animal. His Japanese name origin, uh, Fushigi Dane may be a combination of Fushigi, which means mysterious, and Tane, which means seed. It literally, and it also the name literally means "Isn't it strange?" <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, I so love that. If, so, say Bulbasaur's name. You're just saying, "Isn't it strange?" Which uh, I was talking to Tyler before this episode. I didn't want to get this confused with a later episode because this is Bulbasaur in the Hidden Village. But there's an episode later on that's like Bulbasaur in the mysterious, mysterious forest or something, and it just gets confusing. So lots of Bulbasaur's episodes are about hidden or mysterious things. Bulbasaur is very mysterious, which we will be finding out later. Yes, and so Bulbasaur is based on a frog. According to Ken Sugimori and Atsuko Nishida, uh, which Ken Sugimori is the the artist who made the concept art for most of the Pokemon, at least in, I think he still works for the Pokemon company and makes the concept art. I'm not really sure who Atsuka Nishida is, but he designed Bulbasaur working backwards from Venusaur, meaning Bulbasaur was the last of its evolutionary family to have been designed and was also, also directly based on Venusaur. In particular, its build and ears resemble the Beelzebufo, a large prehistoric frog. Nice. So yeah, so I thought that was interesting that instead of working forward, they had Venusaur, they had how they wanted it to end, and they just worked backwards from there. It makes sense to me. I'd do it that way. Yeah, and now Bulbasaur's biology. Bulbasaur is a small quadruped Pokemon that has blue-green skin with darker patches. It has red eyes with white pupils, pointed ear-like structures on top of its head, and a short, blunt snout with a wide mouth. A pair of small pointed teeth are visible in the upper jaw when its mouth is open. Each of its thick legs end with three sharp claws. On its back is a green plant bulb, which is grown from a seed planted there at birth. The bulb provides it with energy through photosynthesis as well as from nutrient-rich seeds contained within. Uh, Some Pokedex entries from Bulbasaur we have from Red and Blue. It says a strange seed was planted on its back at birth. The plant sprouts and grows with this Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon Yellow says it can go for days without eating a single morsel. In the bulb on its back, it stores energy. And then we have Ruby and Sapphire that says Bulbasaur can be seen napping in bright sunlight. There's a seed on its back. By soaking up the sun's ray, the seed grows progressively larger. So pretty much all Bulbasaur's Pokedex entries just mention that the seed grows larger as Bulbasaur grows larger. And it uses photosynthesis. Um, And then a couple trivia facts about Bulbasaur. We had that 
Neoway released a $1 coin featuring Bulbasaur as part of a commemorative promotion for the Pokemon franchise, with Bulbasaur on one side and the nation's coat of arms on the other. If you remember, they also released one with Pikachu. And then Bulbasaur's evolutionary family is the only starter Pokemon evolutionary family to have each member appear at least once in the Super Smash Bros. series. That's amazing. I don't remember, uh, um, is it Ivysaur? Ivysaur's in it now. He's in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. He's right, the mid- right, right. With the Pokemon trainer. Venusaur came out of a Pokeball, and I'm... Uh, I'm not sure where Bulbasaur appears. I think Bulbasaur might come out of the wall in Saffron City, or he's in the background of one of the I think shows. you can play as Bulbasaur in one of them. I, I don't play a lot of Smash. It's not my no. type of game, but I, I'm thinking that uh, it does show up in one of the generations. I think it does. Well, no, it's always been Ivysaur the middle, because it went Squirtle, Ivysaur, Charizard with Pokemon Trainer. So I'm, oh. I'm wondering if Bulbasaur just appears in the background of a stage. Okay, interesting. But yeah, so that is Bulbasaur. So he was our Who's That Pokemon for this week. And so let's get back to the episode. Who's That Pokemon? All right. So we jump back into the episode. As a reminder, Misty was just joking with Brock that, uh, you know, he must love her and all that stuff because they like both like taking care of Pokemon. Melanie then apologizes to him as if it were... It, it, it basically apologizes to the group because apparently it was her who set up these traps. She explains that she sets up traps on the way to the Pokemon Village where they're having their little Pokemon spa in order to keep trainers from getting there and trying to capture some of the Pokemon she's helping out. And I have to wonder, Jeff, does she just like to leave them up there until they die or something? Like, the whole idea of these traps is to prevent the Pokemon trainers from getting to the village, so theoretically she has to do something with them. She can't just, like, you know, cut them down and send them away. That's only going to make them more suspicious. My theory is that her cabin is actually a murder cabin. A murder cabin? A murder cabin, Jeff. She seems all nice, sweet, and innocent and all that stuff, but, like, you gotta wonder. This is a hidden, okay? This is a secret. This is a secret thing. In the Pokemon universe, they have advanced technology than what we had in the late 90s, you know, with the telephones that have the computers and all that stuff. You gotta think if somebody had found this thing before, people would know about it, they'd be able to look it up, the internet did exist at this time, but they don't. Which leads me to believe that every Pokemon trainer that has been down that trail heading towards the village has suddenly and inexplicably disappeared. Maybe that's why Ash's father never returned. (gasps) That is deep. I love that theory. I'm going to go with that theory. That's better than the Ash's dad stalking them from a distance thing. You don't like him as the narrator? I mean, I do. I did. But I like this better. Uh, I I think that maybe once they die, she just throws them into the river. I mean, it's always the friendly ones that end up with the horror stories. Absolutely. Like, this is like turning in. I I, I was kind of wondering as I was watching the episode and she said that because it triggered my thoughts. I'm like, so what does she do with them after she catches them in the traps? I'm thinking it's like going to turn into like Stephen King's misery or something where she like locks them up. And I, I don't know. Bad things are definitely not happening here. All right. And they never really do explain it. But I, I'm I'm going to stand by that. There's definitely some murdering going on here. We don't know what that Pokemon food she was feeding them is made of. <sighs> Oh, man, this is getting real dark. We're just going deeper and deeper. You know, like a Sweeney Todd situation with Mrs. Lovett, the hair? There you go. I like that. I'm adding that to my theory. Melanie's meat pies. You've seen Sweeney Todd, right? A long time ago, yeah. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, But I think we're going on a huge tangent here. Uh, Let us know if you think Melanie is running a murder cabin. Yeah, exactly. I'd love to get some other people's theories on this, because she's definitely doing something with them. Melanie then explains that she must protect the injured Pokemon. Apparently the bridge was also a trap. Okay, I'm going to have to go into dad mode again, but I'm think at first, but now that we've talked about her have running a murder spree thing, um, it makes sense, because I put this as very unsafe. Like, I understand the pits, I understand the nets, you know, leaning them into the air but like just completely collapsing a bridge that someone's trying to cross i mean if someone survived that you know 
you know, they could just sue her. She would have no argument in court. Just because someone is passing through does not mean they're going to hurt the Pokemon. So she could be, you know, hurting just normal, everyday people. I mean, she almost did with Ash, M- Misty, and Brock coming through. Brock could have died falling. Yeah, because they weren't looking for this mysterious hidden village. They never made any mention of that. They were just lost and on the way to Vermilion City. Yeah, and if there's a bridge, obviously that might mean, oh, I'm getting close to a path. Yeah, exactly. So, right after she explains that the bridge was a trap, we cut to Team Rocket shimmying across the broken bridge, and James says he wonders how they will carry all of the Pokemon that they're going to find on the other side. Meowth says they will cross that bridge when they come to it. Ha. (laughs) Just then, the bridge breaks, and they hit the cliff on the other side. They then fall into the river. We flash back to the cabin where Brock explains that he promised Melanie they wouldn't try to catch any Pokemon. Misty teases Brock, saying that he must have promised with a kiss, and Brock immediately hits her on top of the head with his fist twice. It's nice seeing someone being violent towards Misty for once. I know. Misty's Misty's always, like, throwing hits and everything, and it is kind of a breath of fresh air seeing someone, like, lash back. And actually, there's something I wanted to talk about here. So, we've talked in previous episodes, they've cut out those parts where Misty's hit them. And you you feel like this would be a part they would cut out, because this isn't just violence, it's violence towards women? Yeah, I know, right? Like, they've cut out all the scenes where where Misty's, like, you know, swinging on people, and then they just leave this one in. Maybe they just thought she deserved it. I mean, fair. Ash then says that he will listen to what Brock said, and he will not try to catch any Pokémon and then wonders if traps will really be good enough to keep robbers away, since you'd have to be pretty stupid to fall into one of those holes. He actually says that. We then flash to Team Rocket, as they do, in fact, fall into a hole. Jesse explains that this is the third hole that they have fallen into. They then keep walking and get caught up in a net trap. So Team Rocket's not doing good on their way to this hidden village. No, but did you notice that James was like, you know, like, oh, man, this is a really good. Yeah, why don't ours ever work? And then he like kind of explains why theirs never work and that one did. Yeah, I know. Right. He's like, it's actually very well hidden. And Jesse did not seem to like that explanation. No, but he's right. So we then flash back to the cabin, also known as the murder cabin. And Brock is helping take care of a star. You we see Misty then apologizing to Oddish, the Oddish from before that she attempted to capture, and explains that she is sorry it was abandoned. Apparently this Oddish was abandoned. That's sad. She offers for them to be friends as a single tear rolls down her cheek. So, I feel like Misty had an ulterior motive here. I feel like she was just, like, you know, pumping Oddish up so then Oddish would just decide to go with her. She was giving her this sad story and, like, just... Hoping that Oddish would be like, oh, maybe I do want to go with you. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. She definitely had ulterior motives. Oddish then sticks out its little leaf hair thing that it uses for its hands, apparently, and it wipes the single tear away from Misty's eyes. Misty apologizes again and says that she hopes it isn't becoming, that she isn't becoming heartless. Just then, Ash shows up and tells her that she is always heartless. Ash, read the room. Ash can't read rooms, okay? He's never read the room before. I did not anticipate he would read the room now. He basically barges into this an emotional scene, ulterior motives, you know, aside, and and completely ruins the moment. Bulbasaur then comes rushing in and actually tackles Misty. Ash tells Bulbasaur that it is rude to tackle people. Ash then tells Bulbasaur it is just mad that Ash was going to beat it. Misty agrees, which I did not expect, and Ash then challenges the Bulbasaur to a battle. Wow, Ash, you literally just said five minutes ago in episode time that you were not going to attempt to battle or capture anything, but I guess he, he kind of changed his mind on that. Melanie then rushes in and explains that Bulbasaur is actually the protector. He has agreed to protect the village, and that is why he attacked Misty. He thought Misty was trying to take Oddish, which in all actuality she probably was. Bulbasaur then begins to push its head into Ash's leg, trying to, like, shove him away, and Melanie explains that this doesn't, that that this Bulbasaur just doesn't like Pokemon trainers, and it wants Ash to leave. Just then, we see Team Rocket again. But now, they are in some giant floating balloon-type contraption that they later refer to as a, what was it, a floating stadium or something? 
Yeah, they called it a stadium, which I was so confused by. Yeah, they they call it a floating stadium anyway, but it's basically this big floaty thing with like balloons attached to it and they're floating around through the sky. They do the little poem and say that they're going to attack the village. They explain that they are idiots for thinking that traps would stop them. If they had this floating object the whole time, why are they just now using it? It really could have saved them a whole lot of trouble if they would have just floated over the forest, because A, it would have helped them find the hidden village a little easier, and B, they wouldn't have fallen in three holes and been captured in a net trap. I mean, even without that, we know they have the giant Meowth air balloon. Hot air balloon. I know. None of it makes sense. And I'm also confused where they got the money for that. You know, it's always an ongoing thing. Not so much yet, but they have no money. But Ash, I like how Ash goes, Oh, they never run out of ideas. Little does he know that they will be coming up with ideas for the next 20 plus years. <laughs> it's true. They never run out. Yeah, they they just keep going. I mean, they're besides Ash, they're the only other recurring characters that are constantly in the episodes from season one. Yep. So Team Rocket then floats over the village and drops down onto the ground with a thud. A suction device comes out of the floating stadium and they begin to suck up all the Pokemon. Hey, at least they're putting the vacuum from a few episodes back to good use. I know, I'm I'm glad to see some continuity here with with the, the objects that they own, uh, because they are definitely using it again. Brock yells for everyone to get into the cabin, a.k.a. the murder cabin, and Oddish begins to get sucked in by the giant vacuum. But Bulbasaur jumps in and uses his vine to grab Oddish. So he's grabbed Oddish with his vine, and he's, like, you know, pushing against the suction of this vacuum, trying to struggle his way over into the cabin. Ash, in a moment of rare courage, jumps out and actually helps Bulbasaur by helping push him into the cabin while he's hanging on to Oddish. Team Rocket then explains that they are happy that they went to the cabin because now all of the Pokemon are in one place. Dun dun dun. However, their plan still fails because just then Bulbasaur hops on the roof of the cabin and begins whipping the floating stadium with his vines. He's literally like whipping the vacuum away. Right after Bulbasaur whips the vacuum away, Ash comes outside and sends out Pidgeotto. And Pidgeotto uses a gust attack to blow away the floating stadium. It basically, like, sends out a giant tornado that's, like, spinning around. It actually works, and Team Rocket is being flung into the air, spinning in this tornado, and the tornado actually carries them away. Yeah, and during this time, Team Rocket are making baseball puns, like, they're, like, going, they'll hit us out of the park, and, or, or something like this. But in the Japanese version, I thought this was interesting that James actually mentions Hideo Nomo, who was a Japanese player that played for the Los Angeles Dodgers at the time that this episode was originally aired. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so bringing the real world into it, but yeah, so. That makes me wonder, does the real world exist and are the people in this world aware of it? Well, Misty mentions Paris. That's true, she does. So they must. They know that we they exist. What if they know we exist, Jeff? What if they know we're here making fun of Ash? Wow, this just got meta. Yes, it did. Misty, after they've been fl- after Team Rocket has been flung off, everyone comes out of the comes out of the cabin, and Misty asks if everyone is okay. And Ash explains that he had just had the wind knocked out of him. <sighs> so many puns in this episode. It is truly painful. Get it? He had the wind knocked out of him because of the tornado, huh? Ash then says that he is happy Bulbasaur was there, and Melanie explains that the, that she thinks Bulbasaur should go with him because she knows Ash will take good care of him. Clearly, she does not know Ash that well if she thinks that this is a good idea. Like, yes, I'm going to take this kid that I met an hour ago and send this Pokemon with him, even though the Pokemon hates him, because I'm just going to assume that he's going to take wonderful care of it. Clearly, she does not know how uh, Ash's journey has gone up until this point. I mean, he's been gone for over two months and only has three Pokemon, so. That's very true. Misty asks, then asks what will happen to the village without protection. And she says that Bulbasaur has done two, and Melanie, I should say, says that Bulbasaur has done too great of a job. It's too safe, and none of the Pokemon actually want to go back into the outside world. And this makes me wonder, what does she mean by that? 
maybe my murder cabin theory is correct, but it's not Melanie doing the murder cabin stuff. It's actually Bulbasaur. Like, is he just, like, finishing everybody <laughs> off? Like, going up to the traps and being like, be gone! And then, like, you know, whips them to death or something with his vines? I have no idea. Has Ash just unwittingly let a psychopath Pokemon onto his team? See, I was thinking it sounded more like a cult. Bulbasaur finds willing Pokemon to follow him and then gives them so much stuff that they never want to leave. That is actually literally a cult. Wow. <laughs> so we've got a murder cabin, we've got a cult. Like, this was a feel-good, like, sweet situation. You know the writers were going for that. But when you really dissect the motives of everybody, and you look at what's going on, we've got a murderous Bulbasaur, a complacent Melanie who's letting him get away with it, and now she finally finds the opportunity with some irresponsible, non-intelligent person who's not going to question any of this and says, now's my chance. I can finally get this Bulbasaur out of here because we are all secretly terrified of him. She then explains that Pokemon belong in the wild or with trainers. Which, again, might go with our cult or murder theory, because why, if that's the case, why doesn't she just catch them? That's very true. But Bulbasaur has to bring them in. Man, I, I don't know about this Bulbasaur. There's something going on here. We, we will have to keep a close eye on him on, in later episodes. Yes, exactly. So then Melanie elaborates upon her reasoning for sending off Bulbasaur, you know, the fake one that she probably came up with to get Bulbasaur out of her hair, and basically says that her job isn't finished until the Pokemon leave, and really, that is her ultimate goal. She knows that by going with Ash, Bulbasaur will grow strong and happy. Again, she's not making a great judgment call here if that's really what she means, but I'm not so sure now that that's actually what's going on here. Bulbasaur seems initially reluctant to go with Ash, but then agrees to join him on the condition that they battle first. Misty, of course, jumps in and goes, I want a battle, and Ash says, no way. The battle then begins. Ash sends out Pikachu, and it charges at Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur whips it with its vines, but Pikachu is able to tackle it. Again, confused on Ash's selection here. Why would he choose Pikachu here? Uh, electric attacks are not very effective against grass Pokemon, and he has a Pidgeotto in his team. I know, and you know, the thing about Ash is he just doesn't seem to understand the concept of, like, type weaknesses and strengths, because he just never really seems to, to go with that information, even though we do know from things other characters have said that that is an established thing in this world. Everybody yeah. knows about the types, just like in the games, and, and they kind of follow those rules and everything, but Ash is just consistently showing that he is not aware of it at all. So, after Pikachu is uh, has tackled Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur actually is quickly recovers and uses vine wit to slam Pikachu into the ground. So he's literally grabbed Pikachu with his vine and he's raising him up and down and just slamming him on the ground repeatedly. Again, not so sure how th about this Bulbasaur. Pikachu, however, then uses Thunderbolt to shock Bulbasaur. It knocks Bulbasaur out and Ash sends out a Pokeball. A and this is why he doesn't understand types. Because things like this keep happening. Yeah. At least a uh, Thundershock or Thunderbolt can injure a Bulbasaur. When he did it to Geodude, that should have never been able to happen. Yeah, like it wouldn't have been effective at all. No, because it's a ground type. Exactly. But, I mean, it works in this case. It does knock out Bulbasaur, even though it's a, a weak attack against it. And, of course, after Ash sends out the Pokeball, the intense wibble wobble begins. And, you know, the Pokeball's shaking. Everyone stand there like, oh my gosh, is it going to actually capture Bulbasaur? Even though we've already established that Bulbasaur is going with Ash anyway. And fortunately, it clicks. That satisfying click, and Ash has caught Bulbasaur. The party then bids Melanie farewell, and Brock offers to stay and help her out. She, of course, rejects Brock's offer without realizing what he was implying. She doesn't want to give up he she doesn't want him to give up his grand adventures, she says, and the party begins to walk away. Brock looks back longingly, having just been rejected and and is blushing and at this point, Misty begins to tease Brock again. I'm unsure if melanie I think Melanie knew what Brock was trying to do, but at least this time she would she turned him down nicely, unlike Officer Jenny, who said. You know, oh, it'll be way past your bedtime. 
<laughs> That's very true. She let him down. She let him down maturely. But also, like, Brock's a child. Officer Jenny's an adult. I mean, Melanie looks kind of like a child, too. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of got the impression she was more adult-ish. She is taller than them, I believe, in the episode okay. and all that. So, uh, I don't know. I'd have to kind of look into that and see what's going on with that. But either way, either way, it was a nice change of pace for Brock. He needed that nice, you know... He needed that nice letdown as opposed to the just soul-crushing letdowns he's been getting before. Yeah. The narrator then chimes in again and explains that the party is off to Vermilion City and that he hopes the party doesn't take any more shortcuts or may they ne- or they may never actually get there. I actually agree with this. And to be continued comes across the screen. And that's our episode. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, this episode was so much better than the last two. I felt like we had a nice good story going, a kind of uh, underlying story of whether or not Bulbasaur and Melanie were running a murder cabin. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if, and you know, now that I thought about it, and as we were going along and I realized Bulbasaur and all the things that he was doing, I'm kind of starting to think that Melanie was almost like a type of... um, she was like uh not necessarily complacent like almost like a hostage type of thing like bulbasaur just rolled into shop is like these are the rules now she's like okay just let me take care of the pokemon please and then as soon as she had a chance to get rid of him she took it that that (laughs) that there makes perfect sense you know just trying to get rid of him yeah like yeah so maybe she actually doesn't think Ash is competent enough, and maybe she's just hoping maybe Ash will leave him off and that Bulbasaur is just going to die somewhere. That, honestly, that's probably the best thing. Like, as they walk away, she probably goes and, like, back into her murder cabin and sits down and just, like, kind of stares out the window and is like, God, I hope I never see that Bulbasaur ever again in my life. He's a goner now. I sent him with Ash. Then she opens up the back door and starts cleaning all the blood everywhere. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> But yes, uh, we both really enjoyed this episode way more than the other. And if you wanted to tell us what you thought of the episode, you can tweet us at Pokemon Snapshot or send an email at thepokemonsnapshot at gmail.com. And please let us know what you think. We would love to hear some reviews on Apple Podcasts. Uh, If you leave us a review, we may read it on the show. And uh, tune in next week. We will be watching episode 11 charmander the stray pokemon this is gonna be the best episode ever 